everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Joe Slowick, who's going to give us a fascinating talk on the anatomy of ICS disruptive attacks. Please give him a warm welcome to Joe. Thank you. So, are we good for AV? Got the thumbs up? All right. So, first off, I got a little bit of, you know, what my name is or whatever, but who's this guy up on stage? Well, my name's Joe Slowick. I've done threat intelligence, incident response, and some other things. Currently, I work for a company called Dragos, based in Maryland, although I am based in New Mexico. It's an industrial control system focused security company where I do adversary hunting, which is just a cute way of saying that I do threat intelligence work. Before that, I was running incident response operations at Los Alamos National Laboratory. That's why I still live in New Mexico, because I still stay in town. Just kind of hang out and bum around and see if they let me into the nuclear weapons laboratory, because that's what one does. Uh, before that, I was an information warfare officer in the Navy for about five, six years. And way back before that, I was actually a philosophy graduate student that dropped out because that seemed like a really stupid idea. Uh, so really, as you look at this background, you know, I am an unrepentant, uh, you know, just a defender to the core. But past government service, I am now doing this on my own terms, just as Mr. Captain America has moved on in his own little career arc. So our agenda today is we're going to talk about some of the major ICS disruptive events and orient these along the kill chain. You know, it seems like it's a silly idea. I make fun of it a lot, but it's actually really helpful in trying to wrap our arms around how these events play out. Then look at two concrete examples from the last couple of years, the crash override event in Ukraine 2015 and the Trisis event that took place in Saudi Arabia in 2017, and use this to look at how tradecraft within the ICS space has evolved over time. So first, let's break down events. And here's a really busy slide. This is the one you want to take a picture of, I guess, if you're into that sort of thing. Uh, you know, really, when we're looking at the ICS threat space, we've only got a handful of examples that are out there, at least for the real disruptive, bespoke sort of things. Uh, in terms of ICS targeting malware, there's Stuxnet. Didn't take us long to get there, did it? We'll come back to that as we move on as well. Um, so I'm not going to talk about that too much here. At Havix, which was a really interesting piece of software that did some OPC enumeration in order to collect uh, information from devices of interest. Moving on to Black Energy 2, Black Energy Fork that had some specialty tooling for uh, talking with certain human machine interface devices in the ICS environment. And then we get to the things we'll go into a little bit more depth as we move on, crash override and trisis. And you know, five samples of malware really only have about five or six truly disruptive events. So I've sucks in again, all right, moving on. Uh, 2014 German steel mill attack. That's a funny one because no one still has a really good idea what the hell happened there. Uh, all we know is that a steel mill in Germany ate itself and according to BSI, the German domestic security and intelligence service that they say malware is to blame and full stop, that's it. So. Uh, if you know anything about that, please let me know because there's not a whole lot that's publicly available right now. Uh, then we start getting into Ukraine getting uh, manipulated multiple times. So we had 2015 Ukraine with Black Energy 3 just used as a remote access tool in order to then manually deliver a impact by like literally dude BNC'd in and started manipulating controls on the engineering workstation. 2016 got a little more sophisticated with crash override. And then 2017 we had the Trisis event which was been, uh, infecting a safety system which you want to talk about a dick move, that is a dick move. We'll get into why that's a dick move in a little bit. And so looking at this, you know, yeah, we have some events and then only three really were disruptive events that were fueled by malware. So we're seeing that attacks are kind of rare. Why do we always talk about like, ICS is the new hotness or whatever, that the Russians are in the grid and whatnot? Well, we do see an awful lot of probing and reconnaissance activity, you know, going back to Dragonfly, which was deploying the Havix malware in 2013 to 2014, and then moving into a lot of electric utility probing we've seen from about 2015 to the present, including some things that uh, we've disclosed as a company going into 2018. So there's certainly a lot of people operating in this space, but thankfully, knock on something, not too many people that are turning off the lights or causing things to explode. Having said that, though, there's an awful lot of bullshit out there. So even if you were just checking Twitter and whatnot the other day when there was the event in Massachusetts with 60-some-odd you know, natural gas-related fires, you had this joker out there saying, like, oh, Russian cyber attack with weaponized Stuxnet. I don't even know what the hell that means. 
Uh, but it's not the first time. You go back to 2008 with the Turkey Seon pipeline, had an explosion, malware to blame, no evidence whatsoever since disproven, uh, along with other things. So there's a lot of noise in this space that makes it hard to actually extract signal from it and muddies the waters to understand how these attacks occur and how to defend against them or execute them yourself if you're an asshole. So looking at ICS attack insights, disruptive malware is thankfully rather rare, probing and such is increasing. Uh, but one thing that's important as you look at these attacks is that they're often fairly narrowly tailored to the environment in question. So that means that direct replays of attacks are very unlikely. So we've seen Stuxnet, you know, I keep saying it, like if we were doing shots for this, I'd be almost halfway lit up by now. Uh, but Stuxnet, it, to its credit, was very well designed in the sense that while it spread further than it probably wanted to, it was only designed to take a, an effect when it encountered the appropriate type of Siemens Step 7 programmable logic controller that just so happened to be used in a nuclear enrichment facility of interest. Uh, crash override was a little modular in nature, but even then it was tailored to a power plant electric, well, an electric distribution environment for manipulating, you know, electric power distribution in the target environment. And Trisis was very specifically designed towards the exact piece of equipment it was deployed against. So none of these can you just simply take them and deploy it somewhere else and expect something to happen unless it happens to be the exact same environment that was originally targeted. You got a lot of work to do in order to make sure that these things could be useful anywhere else. So in looking at this, you know, how does this relate then to the overall attack life cycle? Well, the thing is, is that when we start looking at these sorts of attacks, the things that tend to garner the most attention is that very last stage. So, you know, looking at the ICS cyber kill chain, you know, first off, I sort of detest the use of kill chains. There's MITRE kill chain, or not MITRE, uh, Mandiant kill chain, Lockheed Martin kill chain, blockchain, two chains, all sorts of chains. You know, it gets a little confusing after a while, but by orienting how these attacks play out across just the multiple steps involved. I mean, are, do we have pen testers in the room? Or any sort of, you know, pseudo black hats? Uh, okay, tough crowd. But anyway, you know, executing some sort of an attack isn't just simply run something and walk away. There's many steps involved. The problem in looking at how attacks play out in the industrial space is that you have two distinct phases that play out. Your initial access into the enterprise IT environment, followed up by a way of pivoting into your actual industrial control environment. And unfortunately, whether as a result of just it's sexier to talk about or it's easier for us to focus on, much attention gets paid to the very end of this entire event, that execution of an ICS disruptive attack, which is fair because that's the most exciting stuff, but it ignores that for this to be successful, unless you walk into the environment and log onto the device, you know, physical access or something along those lines, you need to do all of this in order to be successful to even get there in the first place. So if we really want to understand the anatomy of an ICS attack, focusing just on this last stage means you miss an awful lot of necessary context for how to get into these environments, figure out what's going on, be able to deliver some sort of an impact on target, and then actually get it in there and execute it. So this extent expanded view via a kill chain like approach really gives you the opportunity that since there's so few events in question for us to analyze whether as attack emulation or from a defender perspective you know what do you learn from Stuxnet like well if you're trying to target Siemens step 7 PLCs probably quite a bit otherwise it's a notional attack vector unless you look at how it was able to breach into the environment spread to where it needed to go into a theoretically air gapped environment and then do bad things so expanding our view to what were those enabling factors really starts to shed light on a lot more factors that are common among different target networks that allow us to start building up an understanding of how do you break into these networks, what information do you need to gather, what capabilities do you need to deploy, and that yields information that is of value. So having said that as background, what, let's talk about some events. So crash override occurred late 2016. I made an error earlier in saying 2015. Uh, 17 December, Ukraine for the second year in a row had a bad day right in the middle of winter. Uh, not a nice time to lose power if you're a Ukrainian national. But uh, just before midnight, there was a substation in the greater Kiev area that ended up getting de-energized, resulted in a service shutdown. Now, thankfully, they had some manual control over the service yard in question, so they were able to recover operations pretty damn quick, even though there was some nastiness in what the root cause of this was. Have to be malware. Uh, might not be the case if that happened in the U.S., though, or other places where we're really used to having a lot of remote access and remote management of this sort of equipment. So there was a lot of initial analysis on this, including by myself and my company. So you had ESET, you know, 
in Destroyer, us crash override, long story, we can talk about it in the bar afterwards. Uh, we co-presented at Black Hat in 2017, that's Robert Lepofsky right there from ESET. So it sounds like, well, this was covered into the ground, wasn't it? You had a Black Hat discussion on this. What else could be said? Well, the thing is, there was actually quite a lot to learn from this event and not a lot that was discussed that really goes into that whole of kill chain approach I mentioned earlier. So while it was seemingly well documented and well publicized, there were a lot of critical questions that just weren't even addressed or left unanswered, such as how was the ICS network even penetrated in the first place, a non-trivial step. Uh, what were the, ice, the actual capabilities of the malware beyond it was able to turn the lights up, or in this case, open breakers that control electric distribution? And how do we then take all that information to start building up a layered defense against not crash override per se, but against crash override-like attacks that take advantage of what that infiltration all the way in route to execution looked like? So if you look at this as an event in question, it's not just a bolt from the blue, but rather a culmination of events, beginning with the initial penetration of your ICS network, establishing a foothold within that network, enumerating systems and protocols, and then delivering an attack. All of that takes time. It doesn't just happen, or if it does, you have a very badly run environment. So in looking at crash override in context, you had a lot of prepositioning that was necessary in order to pull this off. Additionally, depending upon what sort of information you have in the target environment to begin with, maybe you're lucky and you were able to harvest a lot of spreadsheets or documentation from the enterprise IT network or do some searching around on the open internet to figure out what gear is operating in the environment, but chances are you're going to need to do some network and protocol enumeration as well to see just what sort of equipment you're targeting. So we're not talking days, probably not even talking weeks. Um, I have a white paper that will be coming out on this in detail in another month. Uh, but you know, it really looks like months in terms of development, reconnaissance time, and then attack deployment. So really, you need to develop those access points to get into the network, some means of moving around laterally, and then developing and deploying a capability to deliver that disruptive effect that grabs all the attention. So in looking at this, based upon some data that we were able to gather uh, through somewhat interesting sources, uh, what sort of tools were involved beyond the headline crash override malware framework? Well, a lot of things that look a lot like Pentester 101, SANS 560, you know, take your choice or whatever thing of uh, class or training going on. You know, we had Mimikatz, both just pull the Mimikatz source code off of GitHub, compile it, one version, and then do the same thing with Packet with UPX. That's it. Um, so not a whole lot of sophistication there, not even trying to hide. Uh, PS exec used, although an older version, which is of interest, uh, because that was you know, several versions older at the time of the attack than it needed to be, which indicates that someone was using a tool repo of some sort that was not being very well maintained. And then a lot of scripts, uh, and I'll have some examples or whatever using, used for things like file transfer, service ti um, execution timing, service scheduling, and there were a few custom items. There was a port scanner, like Nmap exists, why would you rewrite Nmap? I mean, it still gets picked up by AV too, so I don't know. There was also a back door that took up a lot of attention in the initial analysis, including by us because we didn't have a lot of context last year when we were looking at this. But what was interesting when we started looking into the event in light of the additional data we were able to gather on the attack itself, there was something interesting about what was deemed to be the back door that allowed crash override to take place. So while you can see from file metadata that they wiped timestamps, so January 1, 1970, okay, pretty standard, they didn't clean up everything completely and there were actually artifacts left in the binary when we started doing analysis that showed uh, there was some time zone chicanery going on here. Uh, this was compiled and deployed right before the attack took place. So everything that kind of got rolled up as being the crash override attack framework didn't really come into play until hours uh, before the attack was executed. All those other tools that I mentioned, which are not all that sophisticated tools, were really the driving factors behind how this uh, intrusion took place leading up to the actual disruptive event. So for example, this looks like something you would find on TechNet or some other like Stack Overflow like uh, resource for just moving files around through some scripting. There's no obfuscation here. You know, read in username and password and whatnot. Again, credential harvesting and reuse was vital to how this attack played out because it really uh, underpinned all the actions in the environment, whether running locally as root or being or as admin or being able to move laterally through the network by just doing things like mounting shares and copying files using scripts such as this. So yeah, pretty plain as day. Looks almost like a legitimate sysadmin tool, but used in the case of crash override to start moving the attack payloads through the network. A little more snarky. Uh, 
little PowerShell. This was not deobfuscated and presented. This is exactly how it appeared in the environment as far as we can tell. Uh, not even trying to hide here. Doing a pull for a MS update resource direct from an IP. Uh, it is proxy aware, so okay, someone was trying a little hard, but not even trying to do any sort of base64 encoding or obfuscation and whatnot. So pretty plain as day. If you have PowerShell visibility, you're going to catch this. It's not a whole lot of industrial environments I'm aware of that have very good uh, visibility into PowerShell execution, though. So know your environment, know what its limitations are when designing your attack. And then for scheduling the final attack itself, well, just use a script to schedule remote services. And uh, in this case, um, this is the syntax for executing the crash override framework since it involves multiple inputs. You know, take the initialization or the launcher file, pass to it what the payload package will be, which is specific to each ICS impact, feed it a configuration file, set it as an auto start service, and the uh, executable itself has a timer in it to tell it when to load up and start doing things like opening breakers and turning off the power. And again, like nothing here is really seeming all that complex and certainly not all that obfuscated. If you know, you know a little background of what happened, it's pretty clear what's going on here. You know, this leads up to the eye chart, which I should have designed a little bit better if I was doing these slides over into what the crash override framework itself does. Uh, as I said before, it's modular in nature. Uh, as we discovered it and as it was executed in the environment, you had a single launcher, uh, asterisk there, there was one variant, uh, I won't go into that in too much detail here, that launches or is capable of executing four different payloads for different communication schema for running an electric distribution environment. Uh, the idea behind that is target multiple devices that are managing the flow of electricity to open breakers and thus de-energize lines, turn off the power. After that happens, a one or two hour timer window opens up and that leads to a wiper or destructive opponent, also known as the asshole stage of the attack. So to timeline this out, launcher starts select a payload via the command line. Uh, it's another interesting thing with how this and Trisis as well as we'll see are laid out is that these aren't standalone binaries that you know fire and forget and walk away. It requires command line inputs, proper uh, syntax in order for these things to work, which makes it a pain in the ass for sandboxes in order to figure out that something's going on. Not that they really can identify that these things are malicious to begin with because as a Windows executable, it doesn't look all that malicious. From an industrial standpoint, it's very malicious, but depending on what your context is for looking at these, you might not notice. But anyway, after that fires off, you get uh, execution of the passed in payload, which determines what industrial protocol it's going to speak to, to what controlling gear in the environment. Open up breakers, then pass on to the wiper, which again, one or two hour time frame, depending upon the sample in question. Uh, and that deletes files, remaps system services to null values, and then causes a system fault to shut down the controller. Now from a where does this take place, so crash override itself is running on a Windows workstation, it's Windows malware, duh, uh, but a workstation that then communicates to PLCs that actually control the phys underlying physical process. So at this stage with the wiper, what it's targeting is the ability for the engineers to recover that environment by reloading project files or configuration files for how that gear is set up. So really it's designed as an operator attack by making it more difficult to try and restore the environment. Now I said earlier that they were able to manually recover operations for how this particular generate or distribution substation was set up, uh, which won't always be the case depending upon the environment that you're in. And then as a post-attack thing, there were a couple of things that were uh, left behind. There was a Trojanized version of Notepad, which was kind of interesting, that open up Notepad, calls out for something that looks like a interpreter listener in order to get access to the system again. And then they tried using a 2015 vulnerability against Siemens Cypertech devices. Uh, it's a denial of service and especially crafted UDP packet and bad things happen. Except the guys who put this together uh, screwed around with the endianness for how they were reading in IP addresses in a static list within the malware itself so everything was written backwards, so it didn't work. So even your advanced state-sponsored attackers don't necessarily get everything right or test everything before they actually deploy it in environments that they are targeting. Moving on. You know, what are we seeing here? So from an initial intrusion and lateral movement, we're seeing a lot of commodity sort of living off the land techniques, things that you would expect out of, you know, a fairly generic penetration testing engagement. But then on final execution, hours before the impact gets delivered, it's only then that we start seeing the more complex ICS-aware uh, custom sort of malware coming into the environment. Uh, you can look at this from a number of ways that's sort of holding cards close to your vest instead of exposing them early in case this incident gets picked up and then you provide your response team with interesting samples to look at for what the, they were planning on doing so it minimizes exposure. Uh, but it also means that you're not 
in, uh, presenting unique items to key off of from a defensive standpoint until you've essentially achieved your impact on target. You've turned the power out. So as far as how this works from a preparation standpoint as well as a defensive standpoint, you know, the adversaries in this question were very aware of the limitations within the target environment and in most industrial networks in general in terms of visibility, especially host visibility, but also what requirements exist for remote access and management. Engineers are going to be VPNing or RDPing into boxes in order to manage them remotely from whatever control station they sit in to devices out in the field. So instead of using some esoteric exploit or you know, really custom command and control protocols, capture credentials and RDP throughout the network and blend in with your engineers. And thus leveraging common tools in order to facilitate that by capturing credentials and then scripting commands in order to facilitate execution and spread throughout the environment. So the only thing that looks like malware comes in at the final stages and even then it's ICS specific malware so a lot of your traditional Windows approaches aren't gonna really flag this as necessarily malicious. Suspicious maybe, but not malicious. And thus the <clears throat> Initial intrusion and everything really blends in with a lot of regular system activity because again, using uh, what's required just to manage and maintain these networks on a day-to-day -day basis in order to move about and seed the environment for the ultimate attack. All right, so we talked about crash override. Let's talk about Trisis, a little bit more recent, uh, a little more mysterious in the news for good reasons. Um, you know, this headline's a little alarmist, but you know, Trisis is a event that happened at a gas processing plant in Saudi Arabia in August, quotes around that, of 2017. The infection resulted in a system shutdown, but a system shutdown during exploitation. So it wasn't necessarily the attack itself that resulted in the shutdown, but rather something seemed to have gone wrong that resulted in the targeted safety system to trip. Now the attack itself was, as I indicated earlier, it's very narrowly focused on a Schneider Electric Triconics device, a safety instrumented system, specifically running uh, the 3008 version running the PowerPC processor, whereas more recent versions use an ARM processor. So unless you're running this exact piece of equipment with the firmware version 11.3 or 10.3, I should have had that up there, uh, Trisis doesn't work for you. It's just not even relevant. So very specifically focused on what uh, was in the target environment here. So quick background, I know I've kind of assumed a lot of ICS knowledge, I've tried to keep this high level, but just for the importance of the significance of this attack, you know, what's a safety instrumented system or SIS? Well, it's a fail safe for an industrial process. To put it very bluntly, this is the gear in the environment that acts as a fail safe that if you know, shit starts going sideways, it steps in in order to make sure that systems are brought to a known safe state. So this is the system designed to make sure that, like that German steel mill, the facility doesn't eat itself and that people don't get hurt or people don't die. Targeting a safety system is a pretty serious thing because even if your ultimate goal, because you can do a lot uh, with where these sit in the network as a result of compromising it, but you are at least tacitly acknowledging that eh, I'm okay if this kills someone uh, if I have an oops as a result of m meddling with the safety system. So that's why, from our perspective at least, this is a pretty big freaking deal. Moving back to Trisis itself, how the attack played out is that first it needed to get connection to assist connecting workstation. You know, what's the point of this if you can't actually talk to the device? And one point of contention that came up with other researchers is that, oh, you never have these things networked. This is an anomaly. Like, uh, no. If you go back 10 years even to vendor documentation by uh, vendors such as um, Honeywell, Yokogawa, et cetera. You know, vendor documentation specifies having these devices with at least limited connectivity into the environments in question in order to take advantage of data transfer, access to other processes and other controllers in the environment. So the idea that you could air gap the problem away is something that hasn't really existed for at least a decade, at least in many cases. Anyway, once you get access to something that can talk to your safety system of interest, uh, Trisis as an attack package gets transferred to it. The EXE, uploads a new tri-station pro um, program to the target safety system, and then it starts ending, um, taking advantage of unmapped controller functions, uh, ways of interacting with it remotely, and adds some new bonus ones to allow, essentially like rootkit level access to the device in question. So pretty sophisticated stuff. I'm not the foremost expert on uh, REing this one, but I can put you in touch with someone who is. The main thing is that as this was executed, something went wrong. Uh, which led to that shutdown at a certain point where the safety system tripped as a result of this uh, attack progression, thus notifying people that, hey, something's wrong. And to the environment's credit, not, they didn't just like, oh, well, reboot it and hope that things come up correctly. They investigated and found that malware was at stake, which is not always an obvious step. Now, looking at itself, sort of like crash override, we're talking about multiple components here. So there's a um, 
trilog.exe, which is compiled Python that reads a bunch of libraries from the oddly enough named library.zip that includes the communications libraries for how to speak to a Schneider Electric Triconics device. And then when those execute, they concatenate two dot bin payloads that get transferred to the safety system to insert that rootkit for further access. And then after that, we don't know what the actual intention was because the attack failed uh, in route to getting to that final stage. So the adversary built and deployed a rootkit for a very specifically designed safety system. That is not a trivial feat of software engineering. The ultimate purpose of that was unknown. There's a lot of different things you can do with that, but just like when we were looking at crash override, this isn't something that you can just hop into an environment, pull up Metasploit, select a couple of packages, exploit a few things and walk away. Like, nope, need a lot of specific knowledge about the environment in question, the device that was impacted, and the access and knowledge necessary in order to gather all those details to put together your attack. Furthermore, when we start looking at that whole of kill chain approach, and unfortunately our information isn't quite as good in this respect as I would like it to be, um, we're seeing a combination of items that were used to facilitate this. There were some custom executables that were used as tools, things like password dumpers, that credential theft thing comes up as very important again, uh, Mimikatz functionality, so dumping LSAS memory, uh, and then some simple but fairly effective backdoor tools, but really driving a lot of this was the same credential capture and replay, again, taking advantage of the fact that in these environments, by necessity, engineers are going to need to remotely authenticate to and work with systems just to operate the environment. Overall, you could look at this like, well, that's not a very sophisticated attack. I always call bullshit on that because an attack is only as sophisticated as it needs to be. Otherwise, why bother? So in this respect, the adversary did just what they needed to in order to get in position to deliver the more custom or more esoteric exploit and thus gain the disruptive effect on the safety system. So from a pre-attack standpoint, pre-attack being pre the execution of the safety system targeted malware, really just looking to support and enable that ICS attack. Penetrate the network, establish infiltration and exfiltration routes so that you can move your attack payload in the network, and just don't get caught. There's evidence that some of this might have been detected by the victim network, uh, but because they were kind of using fairly commodity-looking tools and not really burning anything uh, very fancy or custom, you know, if you look at this, from a, especially from an overtaxed incident responder standpoint, like, oh, well, we caught a little bit of malware, doesn't look all that sophisticated, let's move on. That's an assumption, but it, it's a fairly safe one in a lot of environments that some of the tools in question may have simply been brushed aside as a minor infection event when really it was part of a much more nasty hole. So really this is working as an enabling uh, mission. So harvest credentials in order to start pivoting through the environment. There's indications even that the adversary in this case, indicating a level of sophistication, was able to likely uh, defeat a multi-factor authentication mechanism that was employed or recently employed in the environment. So certainly they were capable of doing some rather fancy things. Uh, defeating VPN infrastructure and just figuring out ways in order to get into the environment, dig in, and then get ready to deliver the custom sort of tools. So what the attacker avoided in this, really, aside from the actual Trisis payload, is the sort of complex malware that we see in association with groups like Fancy Bear, so like the Sednit kit, or um, you know, going to APT3 and Perpy malware or whatever, really complex pieces of software that are nice from a defender or a researcher's point of view because it's really easy to build signatures off of them. Instead, you know, of avoiding, additionally, no custom C2, custom encoding schema, just, again, remotely off to the network and hide it in the RDP traffic, thus avoiding the sorts of things that you build signatures and detection sets around. The result is the adversary, just like with Crash Override, blends into the environment, avoids a lot of common touch points for defenders, and when caught or if caught before that final disruptive phase can look very commodity or uninteresting from a responder's or a uh, forensic expert's perspective. So the result is that you get sort of a bifurcated attack. So you have a complex exploit and rootkit design specifically for one make model and firmware version of a safety system. That's a lot of expensive effort on a very narrowly defined target base that provides the capability to manipulate safety logic somewhat undetected and is the precursor to a potential cyber physical event. But then enabling all that, you have a bunch of sort of, again, commodity blending in techniques and a lot of use of either off the shelf sort of scripts and other commands, a little bit of customization, and then otherwise just relying on credential capture and um, system commands in order to get into a place to deliver that actual final payload. So how does this actually map to the you know, overall, and you know, looking at the anatomy of these attacks, what sort of lessons can we learn for where tradecraft is evolving? 
So what we can learn is that initial access and lateral movement, your high-end adversaries that are capable of executing something like a Trisis event or a crash override event, are eschewing custom malware tools. They're not using these until absolutely necessary as part of their operations. There are no sednits or perpies or, uh, I don't know, pick something else. A ghost is still a thing too, I guess. But uh, you know, anyway, the sorts of things that malware analysts build their careers off of, instead using things like PowerShell scripts and just scripting native Windows commands to get into the position to deliver the final custom designed ICS attack. At that stage, we get stuff that is really interesting, highly customized, that you can build signatures off of, but because, like in the case of the uh, Trisis attack, and less so, but still to some degree, the crash override attack, you can build signatures for these sorts of things, but they're not very useful because the malware in question is only gonna work in a very limited set of environments. So a sys attack against a Honeywell, Yokogawa, GE, or other environment is gonna look from a malware level, a lot different from the one targeting Schneider Electric. You could even argue, and I will argue, that you know, aside from doing things like packing your malware, not using compiled Python for God's sakes, um, you know, something like UPX packing and whatnot, it's t trivially easy to try to obey these detections, not even going into the actual functional uh, operation of how the malware works. So what we see then is a sort of division and effort for how these attacks play out when we map these to the kill chain. So your initial access, you know, all of your run up to that executing an ICS attack looks fairly commodity in nature, not a whole lot of custom tools involved, a lot of blending in, really relying on living off the land. And then once we get into the point where we know what we're looking at within the ICS environment, what sort of attack needs to be executed, then and only then at this final stage of delivering and executing an ICS attack, do attackers show their hands, so to speak, and deliver something that really looks like, well, that really is sophisticated, narrowly tailored malware designed to disrupt industrial processes. Part of this, and this goes into some bigger points, is that you know, this living off the land scripting, et cetera, really represents a simplification of operations in that you can facilitate development, you can maybe minimize specialist skills, although I would argue that knowing what tools and when to use them is actually a very uh, advanced skill set for or to make sure that you're evading detection and not leaving that much in the way of a footprint on the environment, but we can discuss that later. Uh, and it makes it harder at these initial stages to break out an intrusion as quote unquote advanced. Overall, it represents a simplification of TTPs, if only from the standpoint of being able to do things like develop Yara for these or develop a snort signature against a custom C2 profile. None of that exists, so unless you're really doing in-depth host monitoring and mapping logins and looking for anomalies there and whatnot, it's very hard to see how these attacks are being executed at early stages. So the things that are really driving this process, credential theft keeps coming up, keeps coming up to this day for things like the grid probing we've seen in the US and the United Kingdom. We see theft via phishing, via leaking. For, uh, there was an interesting redirect or inserting a little reference to a file object within web pages or, e or documents that then prompts an external SMB connection and harvesting credentials from that, uh, as well as dumping within the environment through Mimikatz or other tools, key, uh, key loggers, et cetera. But once harvested, it allows adversaries to take advantage of the natural environment, uh, operational environment within industrial networks of remote access, remote authentication, remote administration to blend in with regular engineer traffic. Multi-factor can help. But Trisys indicates that that might not be the thing that really, you know, it's not the silver bullet, so to speak. It's better than nothing. Don't get me wrong. You MFA all the things, but doesn't necessarily, hello, block everything. Supplementing that or then following the ability to harvest credentials, living off the land. So I'm able to log on as administrator, remotely access a system with elevated privileges. Now I can use PowerShell, WMI, CMD, take your pick to do whatever I want in the system, such as create backdoor accounts, um, it, change firewall rules to allow for remote access from other machines, enumerate the system, transfer and execute files, including remotely if I have PSExec at my disposal. And as a result, you're evading AV detection Maybe you're learning on PS exec, but if, depending on your environment, that might not be such a good thing. But also simplifies development and deployment because I don't need to bring in tools with me because all my tools are already waiting for me once I get into the environment. It also means I've reduced a touch point that, you know, presumably files are being analyzed as they're brought in from enterprise IT into a segregated industrial network. Now that I'm not necessarily bringing tools over though, I don't have that as a potential detection point. Furthermore, you're really blending in with system and network operations. At the ICS level, 
we're seeing a different trend with increasing complexity in that specialist knowledge, like for example, from 2015 to 2016 Ukraine. 2015 Ukraine, someone just remotely accessed the engineering workstation. You can see video on YouTube of the mouse moving while the operator films with his cell phone uh, and opening breakers manually. Crash Override automates that process by writing malware to manipulate the control gear in question. So what you're doing is codifying the specialist knowledge required to manipulate the industrial system in software. What that means is that the person who is delivering the attack, they just don't need to know a damn thing about industrial processes in order to deliver the effect because their supporting development team codified all that expert knowledge in the software they run, and they just need to get in position in order to execute it in the right spot. So we've seen this in the crash override attack modules, so the different ways the communication are structured for each of the payload modules in effect, as well as in the Trisys rootkit by providing the means of you know, how to communicate using the TriStation protocol, what the function codes were that needed to be overwritten or rather enabled that were not enabled by default, et cetera. So what we see as we move over time is a transition in capabilities, um, you know, avoiding Stuxnet in this case, because I'm gonna to get to that in a second for how that fits in. You know, we had Havex, which was, you know, had a native ICS capability, again, that ability to query OPC, but very manual in terms of, you know, an operator runs it on a host in order to extract information. Black Energy 2 is kind of the same thing, allows some uh, capabilities against a human machine interface, an HMI device, um, but still operator run. Ukraine 2015 is almost a regression in that really it's just using credential compromise for everything, installing the Black Energy 3 uh, backdoor, you know, rat on target in question and manually manipulating breakers. And then we see an increase in, again, this encoding specialist knowledge in the software itself in crash override and trisis. So encoding the ICS functionality in each of the payloads that crash override looks to, to manipulate uh, switch gear. In the case of Trisis, simplifying the way of interacting with the safety instrumented system, therefore you know, eliminating the need that the person on keyboard accessing the device needs that specialized knowledge in order to interact with it. So the next steps here then is that the overall trend line is towards you know, fairly, I shouldn't say simplistic, but certainly um, malware less ways of initial entry and manipulation of the target environment leading to specialized software designed to manipulate industrial processes. The next logical step, because you know, what do you want to do with any process? Like I don't want to do things manually every time, I want to automate it, script it up, et cetera. Well, start automating all these steps, including your initial propagation and lateral movement, and then introduce some sort of autonomous capability to identify when you're in place in order to deliver your ICS impact of desire and how to execute it. In other words, recreate Stuxnet. So Stuxnet was designed as an autonomous worm. It used a couple of zero days in the Windows environment for, in order to spread and then was aware of when it got into the proper environment in order to then deploy a specific attack against the Siemens um, PLC devices that were of issue. Now, currently, as we're looking at the environment, adversaries are still very much reliant on a human in the loop for that initial infection vector, getting into these networks and uh, getting in place to then deploy something that is ICS aware to deliver an effect. The next step is doing something like we saw with Stuxnet and automating that targeting and propagation phase because we've already seen successful, at least pseudo automation of the actual you know, industrial manipulation part in things like crash override and in Trisis. So with that, we've seen over the last couple of years a return of the worms. Rise is probably not really relevant because everyone remembers Conficker. That's not that long ago. Actually, it is kind of that long ago. But anyway, you know, we had Mirai. Mirai was an internet of shit targeting thing using hard-coded credentials, IoT specific. Okay, not a, really a big deal. But then with WannaCry, things start getting really interesting. Uh, SMB exploit, it was IT focused, but there were industrial environments that to this day are still getting hit with WannaCry uh, because you can't patch all the things there. And once it gets access, and there are a couple different means where that can happen, it spreads like wildfire because SMB1 is unfortunately very much used in these environments for semi-good reasons. But then after we had WannaCry, uh, you know, get to not patch in Bad Rabbit and then start combining your SMB v1 exploits with credential capture and reuse on the fly. So this started encoding Mimikatz functionality into the worm itself so that it could either try the exploit or replay credentials that get harvested as the worm propagates up until Olympic Destroyer, which although IT focused, relied purely on credentials in order for its spread by using a list of hard-coded items that were captured during initial access to the target network and then deploying credential capture and replay on the fly to further propagation. 
Now, considering how many hard-coded default, vendor default passwords, et cetera, exist within industrial environments, very similar to IoT, so we'll talk IIoT, Industrial Internet of Things, that sort of attack is very powerful and likely in these environments, and I'm kind of surprised we haven't seen one or discovered one yet. So we're already seeing autonomous malware emerging that you know, does away with trying to find a couple of really you know, interesting zero days like Stuxnet used, uh, but instead relying purely on the same sort of techniques that we've seen used interactively to spread within these networks. Mostly reflected so far in ransomware and disruptive worms, the only thing that you really need in order to start weaponizing this on a much more worrying scale is building in that level of environmental awareness and including the proper payload to execute an attack package within a industrial environment. So again, that sort of Stuxnet-like functionality. So what's the implications of this? Tradecraft development, as we've seen, means that from a security perspective, and like I said at the beginning, like I am a diehard defender. I don't do pen testing or any of that kind of stuff or whatever. Uh, I want to find this stuff, kick it out, and, or stop it in the first place. This sort of development, though, makes the job harder because the sort of defensive techniques that we've seen popular or at least rise in frequency in enterprise IT environments, greater host visibility through things like Sysmon or OS Query or other packages, uh, the proliferation of so many fancy and very expensive uh, EDR products, et cetera. We don't have that industrial environments, and a lot of cases, you're not going to get those sorts of things because they're either too resource intensive, uh, they can block things that shouldn't be blocked, resulting in service disruption options, et cetera. So you're getting this greater scope of risk that we've seen in enterprise IT for a while, but without being able to migrate some of the same tools that defenders have used to try and get ahead of those threats. Furthermore, based upon how this tradecraft has evolved, we're simplifying operations for the attackers such that, you know, going back 10 years or so maybe, or even five years for that matter, you know, your pool of ICS defenders and ICS attackers were both mercifully small. Uh, almost like you could fit everyone in this whole conference room and just have everyone fight it out and then whoever walks out or whatever, like, we win. Uh, but now, as a result of simplifying things such that you're using fairly generic uh, vanilla IT tradecraft to get into and around these networks, combined with something that's developed elsewhere, the amount of specialized knowledge required to be an attacker is significantly reduced, whereas from a defender standpoint, it's still very high. So there's a mismatch between offense and defense that is emerging. Um, the result is that from an attacker standpoint, the scalability of operations, the ability to you know, enlist, or <laughs> enlist is a loaded word in this space, uh, more talent or more bodies as potential attackers supported by one core development team that does your exploit development, your effects package development, uh, is pretty significant. And if you add on further automation in the scary scenario of you know, creating Stuxnet light, not weaponized Stuxnet like that Twitter garbage from the other day, uh, I hope Everyone has followed that, well, don't follow that thread, it's garbage. But anyway, uh, the idea of encoding that self-propagating worm with ICS environmental awareness will really then significantly tilt the scales against defense such that we're going to have to work a lot harder. So that's all I've got. That was a lot uh, jammed into a short period of time, but I did make sure to leave time for questions. Uh, I've got a list of further reading and references uh, if you're interested in exploring any of these topics in greater detail. There's been a lot of work in this space lately by a lot of great people, so you'll see things from like ESET's report for, uh, on Indestroyer, FireEye's work on Trisis Triton, uh, all the way down to some of the more historical events we've seen, such as with Havocs. So with that, um, you know, questions, comments, rotten produce? Uh, I mean, really, this is just the case of um, Stuxnet, where depending on how you want to look at it, is that you know the introduction of self-propagating malware via USB that allowed for an air gap to be defeated. I would say that the bigger I'm sorry, repeat that last bit. Uh, is this a scenario where the USB is being used in the air gap? Yes. Yeah, nothing, you know, really the important point to take from this, and you know, this is all you'll see, uh, uninformed is probably a nasty word for this, but they are uninformed uh, pieces about like, oh, you know, why are these things networked in the first place? Like, I tell you what, that ship sailed many, many years ago, and we're not going back there. Outside of nuclear power, where there are legal ramifications to connecting these networks, you don't see an actual air gap outside of, well, and even then, like, 
maybe classified networks, nuclear power, and then a few other standalones. Otherwise, the dedicated networks that run your electric power, clean, make sure you have clean water, run manufacturing plants, it's connected to the enterprise environment, if nothing else, like for example with uh, WannaCry. How do you get Wanna, WannaCry on a factory floor? In fact, I, should, I have a slide that shows it on a HMI within an automotive plant. Uh, it's really quite simple. So data historians aggregate data within the industrial environment to monitor processes and keep track of things. A lot of times we'll have connections to various business intelligence uh, services on the enterprise side. You gotta get data transferred between those two and so you have a built-in tunnel that just so happens to be using SMB that's bridging these environments allowing the worm to propagate. Now one of the things that we recommended from that is that doesn't need to be a bi-directional tunnel. Uh, you should try to apply these things safely and any any is not a good firewall rule in almost any uh, case whatsoever. But yeah, the idea that there are air gaps or the possibility of introducing air gaps is something that modern industrial network design and efficiencies just simply doesn't allow anymore. Yep. So you talked a lot about the timeline of the very last stage that is at the last minute. <laughs> what about the initial stage? Is it possible that even though there were only a few events that we know of, there are a lot of systems that already prepped for it? Yep. That is an excellent question. Um, and that's hard because this is where looking at tradecraft you know, for example, something starts out with a phishing campaign. Well, I could fish all the damn time. How do I identify the phishing campaign that's leading to a future industrial impact versus the one that's just trying to, you know, mine cryptocurrency or steal trade secrets or whatnot? You know, the guidance that I, have, I, I give there, the ways of trying to suss those out is, you know, building not just awareness of threats within the industrial environment, but starting to think, you know, the sort of purple teaming exercise of, well, as an attacker, what sort of things would I need to do on that initial access vector to make possible those stage two effects? So if I see a phishing campaign, like, well, did all my process engineers get the same fish or variants of the same thing? If so, I might want the IT security team to look a little bit harder at that one, uh, even if they all seemingly got blocked, than something that seems a little more, you know, disparate or whatever. The same things, uh, like looking at some of the reconnaissance activity that was probing the US and UK grid infrastructure, a lot of that started out as um, watering hole attacks on various ICS resources of inserting that redirect SMB thing in order to harvest credentials and transfer from there. So being able to identify like, well, not just that, oh, I'm leaking credentials, why? But, ooh, wait a minute, this actually represents a targeting profile based upon who my likely users are. Uh, and that's what we're trying to emphasize is, you know, detect and mitigate these things earlier because, you know, while it's more interesting and you're more likely to get a black hat talk when you find and discover that, you know, stage two disruptive attack or whatever, and like, ooh, look at what we found. Uh, I'm perfectly happy to kill all this stuff and shoot it in the face right here and avoiding trying to respond and remediate at that stage. It's hard, but it's kind of where we need to be. <laughs> so. Okay. Anything else? I'll be around. So you can make fun of me later if you want. <laughs> okay. True, why not now? <laughs> All right, well thanks everyone.